Morning. Well, as we continue our series on 1 Timothy today, we're coming to this passage and we're actually finding ourselves at the mountaintop, as it were. And the reason for that is this is the summary statement that Paul gives for writing the entire letter. So if you're new with us this morning, this is actually a great one to come to because it's going to give you kind of an overview of the whole book. We've In this series, we've kind of ascended past Paul's stern warnings against false doctrine, his confident assertions that the core of the gospel is that Jesus saves sinners. We've even waded through the complicated waters of how men and women relate to one another in the church. And the past few weeks, we've focused on the qualifications for leadership in the church, given the importance of the mission. But today... Today, we're coming to the main point. We're zooming out a little bit. We're asking questions like, why does the church exist in the first place? How are we to relate to one another and to the world around us? And and what is the true source of our power? So at the outset today, I want you to think about two things. I want you to think about belief and behavior. Belief and behavior. Paul says in this passage that, how one ought to behave in the household of God is linked to what we confess or what we believe to be true. So we're going to think about each of these things as we walk through four truths. So there's four points this morning. I promise they'll be fast. But four truths that we learn about the church from this passage. And the four truths are the church is a family. The church is alive. The church holds a secret and the church advances and protects. So before we walk through those, let's pray before we dive in. Father, I ask that these spoken words this morning would be faithful to your written word, and that ultimately they would lead us to the living word, Jesus, our rescuer. In his name we pray, amen. So first, we're going to take a look at verse 15. So if you got a Bible or you got a little app on your phone, go ahead and click that open if you didn't open it already. Um, 1 Timothy 3, chapters, or verses 14 to 16. So if you look here, Paul is writing. He says he's writing to Timothy. He's writing these things to you so that if he delays, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. So we're going to focus for our first point on that, on that phrase, the household of God. What does that mean? So the term household, if you think about it, you know, it, can, it can kind of refer to two things. Either it can refer to the structure itself, like the house, or the, the people within it, like the family within the house. But the, a clue for us in terms of which of these Paul is referring to here is that there's familial language throughout the letter of 1 Timothy. I mean, Paul starts the letter um, in one of the first few verses by saying, Timothy, he's writing to Timothy, my true child, my true son in the faith. So it starts with familial language. And then just a few, few chapters later in chapter 5, he instructs Timothy to regard older men as fathers, older women as mothers, Younger men as brothers and younger women as sisters. Fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters. This is a family. So the very first thing that we need to know about what God says the church is, is first and foremost, it's a family. God is our father. He is our Abba. He is the dad. And if you're a Christian, that means that you're a part of an incredible royal family. You are sons and daughters princes and princesses of the high king of the universe. Now, so what does that mean for us? Well, first of all, it means that a church does not run like some of the other things that we're familiar with. So it doesn't run like a business. It doesn't function like the government. It functions first as a family. And just think for a moment, I mean, what, what is a good family like? What's a healthy, functional, good family like? It's been said before that true happiness is having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family that lives in another city. 
Now, that's funny to those of you who might have family that live close, and maybe they're a little too close. They might even be sitting next to you right now. But even if that's funny, I mean, we, we all know that the benefits of a good, healthy family still remain. Love, acceptance, belonging, protection, growth. I mean, who shows up when the best things happen in your life? A good family. Who shows up when the worst things happen? A good family. And God says that's what the church is meant to be like, except it's not founded on merely human, biological, temporary relationships. It's founded on divine, spiritual relation to Jesus as we're united to him by faith, as Jonathan talked about. And we're adopted into a new family, a better family, a forever family. So, I mean, speaking of family, uh, for my family growing up, my, my immediate family wasn't huge. I, I had one, one brother who was younger than me. Um, and, you know, when you're, when you're growing up and you got part of kind of, you know, a, a brother situation, pretty much your only goal in life, like in middle school, is not to be bored. And so we would just invent games and sports and and all types of different things. And one of the games that we invented was called rollerblade basketball. And we thought this was genius. I mean, it was, it was sort of like, you know, a combination of hockey and basketball. And we would play it all the time in the driveway. And I remember one, one particular time, it was, it was really close. It was maybe, I, I like, maybe it was like a finger roll at the buzzer or something. And, and I won. And my brother Drew was super mad. And he was going to take the ball and just like, you know, chuck it out of the yard and walk into the house. On this particular time, though, he chucked it so hard, and he usually didn't have that good of aim, but he chucked this thing like a freaking laser, and it, it, it went right at the, like the, the goal post, and it shot right back, like ricocheted right back at him at eye level, smacked him right between the eyes, but he was on rollerblades. So his feet just went straight up. Man, that was awesome. There were great times like that. But, I mean, there were other times, too. There were, there were not so good times. A little bit earlier, when I was five, he was a little bit younger. Somehow, accidentally, I managed to shove the blade of a pocket knife into the white of his eye. <sighs> he had to wear a patch for a couple weeks, and we were actually pretty concerned that he was going to be blind in that eye. And he likes to remind me of that uh, from time to time now. He has 20-20 vision. It's all good. But, I mean, so... You know, when you have siblings, when you're in a family, this is kind of what it's like. You, you've got good times, you got bad times. You know, you, you have some fun, and you have some fights. And that's kind of how it is, you know, in the church. You know, we're a family. And, and the, the point is, whether you have good times, bad times, you're, you're together. And, you know, a, a good family is meant to be permanent. You, you know, you're not going anywhere. And so maybe you have a relationship like that, you know, with a, with a sibling or, or maybe with a friend that, you know, seems like a brother or sister to you. And what God wants us to know is that there's something important about that familial connection, that brotherly love, that sisterly love that is meant to describe our relationships with one another in the church. So perhaps you're thinking, okay, okay, so church is a family. Well, my family's all screwed up. I don't, I don't want church to be like that. Or maybe you're saying, I love my family. My family's great. It's y'all people that are the problem. And whether you're saying either one of those things, I think what, what Paul would say to us, what God would say to us is, have hope. The church is not a, a temporal institution. It's, it's forever. It's different. And, and so if your relationships are not perfect in the church right now, that's to be expected. I mean, Jesus promised us that. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So, I mean, our job right now is, is not to expect perfection. Our job as a family is to love one another like a family, to overlook wrongs, to forgive each other, not to gossip about each other, to represent our family well in the world. And to remember that we have a, a great older brother. His name is Jesus, and, and he paved the way for us. 
And, and he's at home right now. He's in heaven, and he's preparing a perfect place for each one of us in the heavenly house of God that we're all longing for, even if we don't know it. So with that, let's move along to our second truth that we learn about the church from this passage. So looking again at at verse 15, how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. So the church of the living God. So there's two parts to that phrase. First component is the word church. And this is translated from the Greek word ekklesia. It simply means called out ones. It's referring to people that are gathered for a particular purpose by someone in authority. And again, the focus here is on the people, not the building. The, the church, the church of the living God, it, it, it's an, a living, active organism. You know, like other places in the Bible, the church is called the body of Christ, and that's on purpose. It, 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 we're alive, we're active, we do things. An illuminating passage that kind of sums up the, the significance of this calling is in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. Paul says there, if you're a Christian, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So that's what the church is. But there's a second component to this phrase the church of the living God. Why is that important? Why is that in there? Well, you know, Christianity, the Bible, this is not a fairy tale invented by some Jewish dudes a couple thousand years ago to make us feel better. That's not what it is. This is the church of the living God, like current, living, present. Contrary to popular reports, God is not dead. He's alive. He really is. He's the active living king. And even if we don't see him right now with our physical eyes, he is more real than anything else. He is at this very moment sustaining the entire universe by simply speaking. You guys know that. That's how he made the world, right? He just talked and it... So why does it matter that we're the church of the living God? Well, one, it means your life is not an accident. It's very much on purpose. God is actively, today, weaving together a beautiful tapestry through the good times and the bad times, through the trials, the troubles, the sufferings. And we know this because Jesus himself, who is the Son of God, put himself on the hook for all the suffering in the world. I mean, he went through the worst stuff He put himself in the deepest pit of betrayal, humiliation, abandonment, mistreatment. But he came out the other side. He came out the other side exalted, glorified, ascended. So if you're in here today and you're new to Christianity, or maybe it's something that has never really made a difference in your life, what what we want you to know is that Jesus Christ is real. That he made you and he loves you and he died on your behalf. And he really is worth trusting with your entire being. It's what you were made for. It really is. Now, but for the believers in this room, being the church of the living God has powerful implications on our lives as well. It means that just as Jesus is alive, just as God is active in the world, our faith, our faith in Jesus is meant to be active visible, present. It means that our Christianity actually looks a little bit like Jesus if you squint, and and more and more each passing season. As Jesus' half-brother James wrote, faith by itself, without works, is dead. And James, I mean, he grew up with Jesus, so he had a front row seat to what Jesus' faith, his active faith, looked like. Jesus believed what his father said. He banked on his promises, and he acted on them. So just think about your daily life for a moment. If, if, if our faith in Jesus is not active, 
present and obvious in our thoughts, emotions, and actions, it's as good as dead. But we are the church of the living God, so let's be alive. Like father, like son, and so meant to be like his brothers and sisters. Now, we're going to move ahead here, but before we move on to the third truth in verse 15, a pillar and buttress of the truth, we need to understand what truth God has in mind specifically. So we're on point three here, which is the secret. Let's look at verse 16 together. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. We have this interesting poem here, song, creed. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. So we're going to look at the second half of that verse first, and we're going to look at those, that six, those six components of the truth. This is likely an early creed of the church, kind of like the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. And when you read it the first time, it can be a little confusing as to what they mean exactly and how they fit together, why they're in there. So we're going to really briefly walk through each one and apply just one word to each of the six. So we're going to to have six words that summarize this section. So the first one is incarnation. He was manifested in the flesh. Jesus, fully God, was born like us. He was born like you. He put on, as the Son of God, he put on ordinary human muscles, bones, skin. He walked in the world like we do. And when he lived in the world, he was constantly telling his disciples that he was going to die. He told them that he would be killed by his enemies, but that he would be raised again on the third day. He constantly was telling them this. So that brings us to our second one, vindication. Incarnation, vindication. He was vindicated by the Spirit. So Jesus was vindicated. When was he vindicated? Well, he was vindicated. He was proved right when he was resurrected, when he really did come back from the dead, just like he said he would. He had promised this, and it happened just like he said. So he was vindicated. Third is observation. He was seen by angels, observation. So following his resurrection, you guys probably know this story. It's like the Easter story, right? There's angels that roll away the stone, and then they're standing there when he just walks out of the tomb, breathes in the air that he created, in, and, and walks into the, the early rays of shun, sunshine that, that first Easter morning. And then they were still standing there when Mary and Martha come running up, and they're like, and the angels are like, why are you looking for someone who's alive among the dead? He's risen. That brings us to our next point, declaration. So what do you do after you see something like that? What do you do after you hear something like that? You proclaim it. Declaration proclaimed among the nations. You don't just tell your buddy, you tell everybody. After Jesus appears to his disciples, he gives them the great commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. Take this to the, end of the ends of the earth. And he tells them that because this is an incredible message. It's the secret of life. And so... The disciples are meant to to preach it with force, to herald it with joy. This is how the gospel spreads. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of truth. And that's what this is. This is the word of truth, the core of the gospel. And that brings us to our next point, affirmation. So believed on in the world. As the gospel is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit works, souls are opened, and the message is believed and trusted. The amazing thing here is um, over the last 120 years, when you think about Christianity across the world, it's really underground this dramatic shift. So in in 1900, 75% of the Christians in the world lived north of the equator, primarily centered in Europe and North America, 75%. But today, 120 years later, it's actually flipped. Do you, guys know, do you guys know this? 75% of the Christians in the world live south of the equator. 75% of the Christians in the world live in South America, Africa, and Asia. 
So what's important for us to realize about this, as, as a church in Minnesota, in North America, we are in the minority. The Christian church is not a white Western institution. It started in the Middle East. It is a global, colorful, diverse, amazing bunch of humans that God has called to himself across the whole globe, all tribes and tongues and nations. And I think we need to be humbled by this. And we need to be amazed that the gospel has gone forth so powerfully and and is taking root even as our own country is in complete moral chaos. God does not need the United States. He doesn't. But it is an amazing thing for us to be taken up into this mission, to be used by God in this mission. It's an amazing thing, but he does not need us. That brings us to our last point in this section, ascension. He was taken up in glory. So finally, Jesus ascends to heaven. You can read about this in Acts chapter 1. It says he was, he was taken, uh, a cloud took him out of sight as the disciples were watching. And it's kind of hilarious what happens next because the disciples are sort of just standing there, like drooling and just like slack-jawed. And they must have been standing there for like a long time because some angels actually had to show up and they were like, guys, guys, it's, it, that part's done. You know, like, you know, like and th- what they told him, they said, hey, don't stop, st- what are you staring up in the sky for? He already told you what to do. He told, and, and by the way, he's not gone forever. He's going to come back and he's going to come back the same way that he left. And I mean, this event, Seeing the ascension, telling people about the ascension, this gave the the disciples amazing confidence to declare this message. Because, I mean, can you imagine? Jesus had already, he'd already done the hardest thing ever. He had already proved he could do the hardest possible thing. He came back from the dead. So when he told them, I promise I will be with you to the end of the age, they believed him. Because they saw him, they saw him slip from the physical dimension to the heavenly one. And they knew that he would be right there with them to ensure that the mission was completed. Okay, so now that we understand the particulars of the truth, we're going to look one more time as we, we're still still on point three here. We're going to look again just at what Paul says about it. So he says, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. What is he talking about? So when the New Testament speaks of mystery, it's not talking about like a true, true crime Netflix show that like you can't figure out. It's referring to a secret that God is revealing. And this goes back to what we said at the beginning, so that our behavior and our belief are linked together. Because If we believe the real gospel, those particulars, in all of its fullness, then we will act like we're members of God's family. We'll be active and alive in the world. And that's where this godliness comes in. And it's important here not to confuse godliness with goodliness, because that switches the the order of importance, okay? Godliness is not primarily about us being good first, The focus is not primarily on our behavior. It is on the behavior of Jesus that we put our faith in. And when we do that, it leads to godly behavior. That's how it works. You guys guys get the order of that? It's important. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, As we behold the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to the next. So as we behold the gospel, as we behold God's glory, we are transformed. Our, our behavior becomes more and more godly, not because we try harder, not because we white-knuckle it, but because the gospel is transforming us from the inside out. Okay, so in closing, we're going to move to point four, okay? So now that we have a fuller picture of the secret of godliness, we're going to move to that final point. So in, 
To review, we've said that the church is God's household, God's family. The church is alive and active in the world because God is a living God. And that believing the gospel is the secret to godly living. So how then should the church behave in the world? So looking at verse 15, one last time, you can see it here. We get our final point. The church advances and protects. The church is a pillar and buttress of the truth. Now, to really understand Paul's point here, we have to think a little bit about architecture, okay? So we're going to take buttress first. So first, let's, let's think about buttress. So a buttress, you, you guys probably don't, I don't usually use the word buttress a lot. You probably don't either. So a, a buttress was, was commonly used in ancient architecture. It was structures that were built on the outside of the building that butted up against the walls. And they basically were designed to hold the building in place, to make sure that the roof didn't cave in or it sunk into the ground. Okay, so it was, it was, a, it was a foundation. It was, it was meant to be a brace and a, a reinforcement. And so how is the church a buttress of the truth? Well, our, our job is to defend the core of the message, the core of the message that we just walked through, those six things, from error or drift. Because people are always making up crazy stuff. So we, we need to defend the core of this message because it is the secret to life. The people of the church, and especially its elders, we don't create the truth. We didn't make the stuff up. Rather, we embrace it. We hold it in its rightful place. And we guard against the forces that would pull us away from the true center. But, and this is the last thing. This is the last thing. The church is not just about protecting the truth. We are not hunkering down, afraid of the world, and never advancing, okay? Because the church is a pillar. You guys know, know what pillars are, right? So pillars, pillars are visible. Pillars a lot of times are on the front of the building. They are meant to hold something up, to hold something out. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter says this. He says, as you come to him, as you come to Jesus, you yourselves are like living stones being built up as a spiritual house. And what are you designed to do? He goes on to say, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Okay, so pillars proclaim. Pillars preach. Pillars display. Pillars advance the truth of the gospel in the world. So as individuals and as a corporate body, just think about this for a moment. How are we advancing the gospel in our daily lives? How are we doing that? Are you fulfilling your role as a pillar? Or are you hiding it in the basement? God chose you, Christian, on purpose to fulfill an advancing role in his kingdom. So don't think that you're not enough. It's not about you. It's about his mercy and his excellency. I mean, he called us out of darkness and into marvelous light. You do not hide marvelous light. So don't hide your connection to Jesus. If you were friends with a king, wouldn't you tell people that? That is not something that you hide. You are not ashamed of a connection to the king. So don't be ashamed. Be a pillar. And that brings us to the trough and the table. These are each visible reminders that we're a family. where we meet the living God, where we're forgiven and strengthened by his mysterious grace that allows us to advance the gospel with urgency and defend it with gladness. And remember, Jesus is the center. Jesus is the center of all of this because by his cross, by his body and his blood, what he did for us, he has transferred us from being strangers to being siblings from being dead to being alive, from being dust and disorganized to being unified and valuable 
in the mission of God. So because our elder brother Jesus has won the victory and has established his family with a promise to be with us forever, we can go forth together as the church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the amazing realities that because of the gospel, we are a new family, that we are made alive in Christ as you are the living God, that we have a mission to advance and defend your truth. But we know that your word says that unless you build the house, those who attempt to build it labor in vain. So God, we need you. We ask that you would help us, that you would work in us with divine power as we learn how we ought to behave in your household and in the world. While not forgetting the great secret, the amazing mystery of godliness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.